How are you this morning? You know, it's Easter. So if you can't get excited about being in church today, we need to talk after service. Because this is the Super Bowl of our faith. And the afterglow happens in Acts chapter 2 when the culmination of this event takes place when resurrection life and revelation is poured out upon the whole church. But today, Acts chapter 2 couldn't happen until today happened. When Jesus went from the tomb, from the grave, I mean from the cross to the tomb and descended, the Bible says that he first descended before he ascended. And he took on hell, death, and the grave. There is no final, there is no final victor outside of Jesus Christ. And at that name, every knee should bow, every tongue will confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The dead in Christ will rise. It is that moment that we celebrate. And it, out of all the mystery of trying to understand all of that, isn't it good that we just receive it and take it by faith that it happened? Now, I don't know, you know, we get into the Mondays versus Wednesday versus Thursday. Was it three days? Was it two and a half days? Was it 2.6 days? I want you to be careful not to miss the fact that it happened. Yes, right. Don't get all religious on me and go, well, you know what? He, he said this, and really what it means is this in the Greek. You and I both know that the, the word is stronger than the Greek. And we do know that the truth will make us free. So hear the word today in truth. And I would just encourage each of you today to listen as a new believer, to listen as a non-believer, to hear the fantastic, incredible love story that unfolds this week called Easter. Just hear it again for the first time. I've done a few Easter's now. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Has resonated since about 1983 with us. So... Uh, We've said that a few times. And if you're not careful, you kind of start mailing it in. And maybe it, maybe it was last decade that really meant something to you. And maybe today we're hearing it for somebody else. I'm going to just encourage us all just to take a moment, just as the word came forth this morning. Let's hear it all for the first time. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? If not here, where? The word says, the eyes of the Lord seek to and fro. So seeking to show himself strong on someone's behalf. Maybe today we can say on this Easter Sunday, seek no further people than right here. Lord, show up and let this be your tabernacle today in praise in Jesus' name. What a week we just had, though. If you think through the Bible time, what a week we just had. Last week we were all here and we were talking about the triumphal entry. If you were here, you remember that? Well, if you were here, that's what we talked about. Let me remind you. <laughs> Sometimes I forget what I preach 10 minutes after I'm done, so I don't expect you to remember it all week. We talked about the power of celebration and that Jesus knew what was going to take place. And in the midst of all that, he was still able to celebrate. He was still able to resonate the goodness of God in the midst of, for, of, of, of upcoming pain and suffering. So we go from Palm Sunday, uh, or, or the triumphal entry, to the week of passion, to the holy week, to the week of agony, to the week of silence, to the cross, and to a risen Savior in seven quick days. How many of you have had some weeks like that you feel like maybe in your life? You just thought, how in the world? I mean, I woke up three days ago and life was good, and now it seems like all hell has parked on my front porch. Well, what we know is that our Savior knows everything that we go through. And he went through the Passover. He, he had the triumphal entry. He went through the Passover. He went to the garden. There was agony in his heart and his life. And as he was surrendering his will that final time, then he, then he rises up and he has the betrayal, a kiss from a friend, uh, an arrest. And his mind has got to be twirling now. He knows the humanness of it. He's got to do this. But he also knows through the sovereignty what the end's going to look like. But you still have to feel. The Sanhedrin then mocks him, beats him. The same palm branches that we hailed him as king a few days before is now used to whip him. And I used to beat him. 
And at the same time, he feels the denial, the breaking of relationship to Simon Peter. He foretold that that was going to happen, and yet at the moment it is happening, he's being mocked and beaten, and, and there's this rush of relational and, uh, of intensity, and you hear the denial. Then he's moved, ushered over to, to Herod for a moment to mock and, and to be uh, ridiculed, and then he goes to Pilate, to the authority, and the, the story there of, of the, the dissertation between the two of them, and it's high drama. It's, it, it, it's no more serious conflict than what he's in. And he moves to the scourging. Without getting too morose, it wasn't just 39 lashes with a leather belt, even though that would seem harsh. But it was the cat of nine tails where it was made specifically for torture and not death. Each one of those pieces of leather would have broken glass or pieces of metal or pottery and made that just to the right point to create the, the, the most intense pain that we would know to beat you down, to cause your emotions to overtake you, to finally surrender to the Roman Empire and, um, and the authority of man, to put you in your place. And yet we read in Scripture that by his stripes we're healed. So the dichotomy of one man going through a flesh beating brings a whole new generation of healing to the saints that he does not even know yet exist. And I wonder, was it one or 10 or 38 that maybe his constitution was weakened just ever so slightly? Let's don't forget that he was completely human as well. Let's don't forget that Inside of him resides what's inside of each one of us, and that is safety, security, the will to live, the, the, to go on. We, we do what we do in our life to, to not go through persecution and, and misery and not to be held against our will. Everything within us fights against that as a human being. He didn't lay that aside. Every one he took, he took. He took. They whipped him again. Because it was said that 40 lashes would kill a man. Somehow 39 would save his life. Whatever was left of it. And they're not quite being done yet. Because all of heaven had to turn its heart silent for a moment. For all of hell to feel like they had their day. They put a crown upon his head, thorns. Pushed it down as hard as they could. So the real blood, not drops as of blood, but that real blood would come streaking down his face. They robed him. Just to the point that the fabric would stick to the soaked body and only reopen a wound, a reminder that Rome was still in control. They paraded around and they mocked him, hell, king of the Jews. He heard the ridicule. There were no friends around. Those closest to him had denied him, had betrayed him. The others had scattered. His mother and a few other strong women followed him. And then the walk, maybe three, four hundred feet, I mean yards, quarter, half mile to Golgotha, place of the skull. It's a place that's carved out of a cliff and it looks like a skull. Crucifixions had to take place out of the city wall because somehow we could only kill people ruthlessly outside of our walls. He began to walk. There was someone compelled to pick up his cross for him, Simon of Serene, to pick it up and to carry it to him, and they lay him on 
an old 700 pound, five, 700 pound cross. Instead of just tying his hands to the sides, stretching him out to add injury to insult, they decide to put spikes, nails into his hand, wrist area, into his feet, and to set him on that cross in such a way as not to kill him, but just to cause a suffocation to take place where he would slowly, with every breath that he would fight for, lose his life. To show everybody else you don't want to be in this spot. The most ruthless, ruthless death known to man. On the cross... There's this conscious, subconscious, and unconscious, in and out. The flesh, the heart is still beating. The eyes are still blinking. The lungs are still trying to find air. There's that struggle for life, but at the same time wishing it was over. So there's not much conversation that takes place on the cross. But Jesus manages to pull out seven Amazingly critical atoning phrases. You know, it's important to know what somebody's last words are in life. He starts out as trying to writhe up and get that first breath because he's laid there against his lungs, his own body, trying to suffocate him. He would find the ability to rise against the the tide of the nails and the bonding to get enough breath to speak. His first words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> Says a lot, of, a lot about an individual. His first utterance after being completely annihilated to look down at those that are now going to rent his garment take his last possession and says to them and the Sanhedrin that is watching, Father, forgive them. So when we say the power of the cross, folks, what we're saying is he's a risen Savior. He's an atoning work of, of God. He was able to say in his last breath, do not lay this against their charge. So this Easter, the question is, is on our bad days, is there still forgiveness? Has forgiveness risen in your heart? Is forgiveness risen in our faith? We serve a risen Savior. Do we have the elements of that risen Savior in our own life? Is there forgiveness in our own heart? He looks down. Another phrase woman, behold your son. John, then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. So at the foot of the cross, <laughs> what we see is relationship is born. We become part of the family of God. You know, the significance of the cross is that we no longer have to be religious in our relationship to God. There is not a priest. There's not a mediator between us and him. We don't have to tie anybody's foot, uh, anybody, a rope around anybody's foot as they go into the Holy of Holies in case they're unholy and they have to be drug out. The, the veil has been rent in two. We can walk in and with the ushers as a son and a daughter of the Most High. He is risen and he, and he rose with us. We get to rise up with him and now we are part of the family of God. The cross is relational. It's not religious. He looks at two thieves that are with him. Rightfully so. They have somehow had an injustice to society to the point that they are now worthy of the death penalty. And there's railing going on. Because again, what comes out at the end of a man's life is usually what was in there to begin with. You rip all the, the drama away. You rip all the niceties away. And what you hear is one thief going, hey, you're the son of God. Do something about this. 
You hear people yelling, he saved others himself he cannot save. But you hear somebody else say, you hear one say, hey, Lord, just remember me when you're in paradise. Just remember me. If there's a chance, I'm here deservingly, but if there's a chance, just remember me. And here's what we see is the authority of the name of Jesus. Because it just breaks our theology. This guy did not have every, have every head bow. The music wasn't just right. He wasn't in a church service. He wasn't saying the sinner's prayer. Nothing wrong with any of that. We know that he dies without being baptized. <laughs> Go figure. That one of the last acts of Christ's redemption would be to reach down to a lost and dying and deserving sinner and say, hey, today you will be with me in paradise. What? Don't you feel the Pharisee coming out in you? What? What do you mean you can forgive sins? I think he already went through that one once, didn't he? Oh, you don't think I can forgive sin? Okay, rise up, take up your bed and walk then. See, what we realize is at the cross, at that moment, he's taking on the sins of the world. He's also allowing the, the power of his name to now be projected from the cross forward. So in the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, the authority of Christ, we walk in that identity. In the name of Jesus, all heaven comes to earth and all hell freezes. He says, assuredly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. He has the power to forgive sins. His authority is the way of salvation, and there's no other way but Jesus. And he shows us that the ground is level at the cross. That's good news, folks. The ground is level at the cross. You don't bring some of you. You don't dress up. You don't pretend. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to come from the right educational background. The ground is level at the cross. And a level ground is a risen Savior for all of mankind. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Ground zero, heaven invaded earth, earth raged. Contact of nuclear proportions for restoration. Naked you hung, naked you came. Wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a grave. Sinners mock, sinners sit back in shock. You forgive the same. You took the blame, you cleansed the shame. The great transaction, your life for ours, your scars for ours, your blood for ours, the beautiful exchange, completely unfair, unlevel, unbalanced. You stood in our place, my place. I was your prize? Is, that, is there something wrong with your eyes? You realize I'll compromise. I'm your prize. The reward for which you endured. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We praise on level landscape. Lay prostrate, dance and demonstrate level ground that leaves nothing to hide. No cover for escape. Exposed to encounter all of each other. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. It should be good news for all of us. I believe the enemy has tried to blind the hearts of many and saying, I've done something that's unworthy. I can't get there from here. Jesus loves everybody but me. My world is wrong. There's others that are probably like the rich young ruler. I don't need religion. I don't need Jesus. I've got everything that I need. I want you to know that the ground is level at the cross to the worst of the worst, and to those who think they're the best of the best. Because in my mind, pride is the worst. The ground is level at the cross. We don't bring anything to Jesus except us. It's the greatest exchange of all time. So if you're here today and you were brought here by a family member and you're like, okay, I finally get my favorite Easter uh, dinner when this is over, Let me remind you that for you, the ground is level at the cross. 
that as your heart bows and your tongue confesses the lordship of Jesus Christ, because he laid there and he looked at a thief and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Those who confess Jesus Christ and believe that he was raised from the dead, that he is the son of God, and they confess that with their mouth, believe that in their heart, that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, they will be saved, period. It's good news. Jesus still, a few hours have gone by. It says, after this, knowing all things in John chapter 19 were accomplished. All things were accomplished. What he's realizing is he's taking on the sins of the world during this time. He's taking on what it feels like to be sick. He's taking what it feels like to be absent and, and abandoned by the Father. He takes, he's taking what it feels like, what, what liars feel like. What, he takes the sins of the world and in rapid pace just begins to feel what it feels like to be away from the Father. Something he had never experienced in his whole life. Knowing all things were accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now, we know that that is Scripture that is fulfilled, Old Testament Scripture that he fulfilled out of Psalm, uh, out of Psalm I think, 39. But we also know he is referring to, I thirst, the same moment that he said to the woman at the well, I will give you water that will cause you to never thirst again. Also, in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. So when he's saying I thirst, what he's saying is I'm looking forward to the moment when I'm complete again in the Father. I'm looking forward to the moment when the Holy Spirit is complete again and sent out to send living water to the rest of the children of, uh, of God. I don't just thirst because I need a drink. He was fulfilling prophecy. They gave him a sponge full of vinegar. It fulfilled prophecy. But what we have to realize is that there is a completion at the cross that's taking place. That is the moment that there's a release of the Holy Spirit now that is going to be engaged into a lost and dying world. Jesus said in John chapter 7, 16, 15, 16, and 17, he said, I've got to leave so that he who comes will come for you. He'll lead you in all truth. The Holy Spirit will come and he will guide you and he will tell you of things that I have heard from the Father. He will lead you in all truth. We know that you will never thirst again when you take a full drink of the Holy Spirit. So the cross is that moment that we turn our life to a spirit-filled moment, that we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and, and, we, and we're baptized into a, into, a new, into a new man, a new person, and we receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Church, we are a spirit-filled work of faith in our life. And you don't separate one from the other. The cross completes the work of salvation to the point of power and victory in Revelation, born in the Holy Spirit. Now, I can't give you any better indication that we need to be filled with the Spirit of God because there's a lot of us that are still thirsty. The old song, I'm looking for love in all the wrong places. There's some of us that are saved, we're just not satisfied yet. Because we've got the missing element. We've got the missing person. We need to put out an APB for the Holy Spirit in our life. There's some of us that if the Holy Spirit were to come up, we'd ask him to fill out a guest card and have a seat. We'd get to him in just a minute. We need to invite the all-quenching, all-powerful, third person of the Trinity we need to invite him at the moment of salvation, at the moment of the cross. We recognize the glory of Jesus Christ, that all men will, will be saved under his name. We also need to recognize the infilling moment of the power of the Spirit of God. That is Jesus still doing his work on the earth. God created the plan. Jesus fulfilled the plan. The Holy Spirit reveals the plan. He's God. He will guide you. He will be alongside you. He will lead you. The Holy Spirit will give us that drink of water that will never thirst again. How's your appetite this morning? Are we still trying to find that thing that's going to make it right? 
that right relationship, that, that right thing in our life, that right material thing, that right job, that right conversation, that right moment is found in the person of the Holy Spirit. Then he says, Father, into your hands I commit or I commend my spirit. Folks, there's no victory until there's a surrendered will. Now, if 39 lashes of the cat of nine tails can't do you, and they had to break the other two guys' legs because the Sabbath was coming. But Jesus was found already passed. His legs didn't need to be broken. His side was pierced because he willingly gave up his life. He willingly trusted that the end of the matter was going to be just fine. He willingly, in the midst of taking all the sin, of feeling completely alone from God, oh, Father, why has thou forsaken me? He willingly decided at that moment he could surrender. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. After saying, oh, God, oh, God, why hast thou forsaken me? As I lay the sins in my life, my God, my God, why is that forsaking me? Then he thirsts. Then he says, Father, into my, your hands, I commit, I commend my spirit. How many of us this morning are still struggling with that last act of salvation, the surrendered will? There's been a discussion forever that I've known. I haven't lived forever, but the forever that I've lived in, the discussion has been, are you really saved? Are you sort of saved? It's like, are you really pregnant? Are you sort of pregnant to me? I just don't think there's probably a lot of sort ofs. But there are people that probably have confessed Jesus Christ in the world, in their life, and they're still struggling. We all still struggle a little bit with our will. The fullness of salvation, the acceptance of Christ at the cross, takes a completed surrender will. And there may be some of us that we're still dealing with the fog of life. We're still dealing with the fog of pain and the moment to have that perfect trust that says, can I really? Give this to God. Let me help you with this today. Can I do that for just a minute? I'll try to smile. It's a fake smile. Can you tell? Here's a Noah smile. You don't have, we don't have any control anyway. So those of us that haven't surrendered our will, you really don't have any control anyway. It's just the ability to feel like you've still got some room to wiggle. Now, if you want to choose to take on the wide road, the broad road into Hades, I guess that's your choice. But if we, if we have taken Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, a surrendered will will bring perfect trust and will remember that we can commit ourselves to the Father. Jesus has enough faith that he has trust, and in that trust, the victory of a surrendered will brings him into, into union with the Father. And after he surrenders his will, what's left? He says these words, it is finished. John chapter 19, it is finished. Now, why would he say that? He didn't have to say that. I mean, everybody's going to know it's finished, right? As soon as he breathes his last, it's going to be done. No, he's saying that it's finished so that we'll remember what's finished. The word there is not just it's completed, it's done. The word there, the Greek word there, and I'm only going to give you this much. That, okay? I'm going to give you this much. I don't like all that stuff. I mean, there are teachers that love it. I took enough Greek to get through Bible school. But the Greek word there is very interesting because it means debt paid in full. So when he's finished, he's not like, okay, I've done everything I need to do. I've checked all the boxes off. He's saying it is finished. What he's saying is, 
is completed. The work of salvation, of redemption, of atonement, of, re of, uh, of uh, restoration, of propitiation, all of that is now complete. Put it in the books, sign it, close it, hand the contract to the world, and let them walk in new victory and in new faith. It is finished. He is risen. The tomb is empty. It is finished. He is risen. The tomb is empty. He is finished. He is risen. The tomb is empty. It is finished. And then he gave up his spirit. He was just letting everybody know that it's finished. A slow walk to pay respect to the dead. He is, he is dead. I took the thorns from his head. He's dead. Cloaked by darkness of sorrow, no energy to borrow, I'm empty. This is not empathy, it's an epiphany. And he was stolen from me, beaten relentlessly, tried illegally, murdered for all to see, I'm empty. There's the tomb, a stone throws away. The stone's been rolled away. The guards are gone, his body's gone, the tomb is empty. Commence weeping. Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? My Lord was here in this grave. Did you take him? Where is he laid? The tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. I'm empty. Mary, look at me. I'm risen, it's finished. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty, but we're not because it is finished. The dark clouds may roll in in your life, but they won't stay because it's finished. What does that mean? That means Satan is finished. That means hell has no hold on you or I. That means we are complete. We need nothing else. It means there's no more holes in our heart because we walk in the wholeness of God. It is finished. It means that we no longer need rules and regulations and, and religion, but we have relationship. The debt is finished. It is finished. It's paid in full. So take, take your bill of sale, post it with the blood of Christ, and send it right back to hell where it belongs. It is finished. Death, hell, and the grave have been defeated. Amen. Would you all stand with me for just a minute? He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Let Christ be alive in you today. Hold nothing back. Don't let the enemy ever lie to you again that the cross missed you. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Father, thank you for this time. Bless this congregation. We thank you for Jesus. A Savior who willingly took on the pain the suffering, the aloneness, absorbed all the sin, all the debauchery of humanness. The stripes, the, the crown, the crucifixion. He laid it all upon him. Your heart was silent only for a moment, but not really. It was the sin that was separating. But because the lamb was perfect. You recognized the atoning work of your son. And he is the first, the firstborn of many. And we stand here on this Easter day of 2022, over 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years later. And we say the work is complete in our life. So while you're standing here with your 
eyes closed, just meditating on the goodness of God. And let me ask you this question. Has that work completed in your life? Are you here today knowing that that completion has taken place in your life, that Jesus died for your sins? Are you the thief on the cross that is still trying to figure it all out? And maybe today's your day just to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and was risen from the dead. If that's you, we want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. It's the best decision you could ever make in your life. And it will lead you to not only eternal life, but it will lead you to abundant life. So I'm going to give you an opportunity just to slip up your hand. I'd like to pray with you. And if you don't, that's fine. We're going to be up here at the front at the end. We'd love to pray with you. This is not about us making a scene with your life at all. It's just about an opportunity to celebrate Easter in the most profound way. And that is to become a Christ follower. So while we're just here in this moment, can I pray with anybody? Would you just say, Pastor Rob, please pray for me. I want to I wanna make it right today. Today's my day. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And let's all pray this prayer together. Can we do that? Father in heaven, I confess the need for Jesus. I confess that I am yet a sinner in need of a Savior. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I will follow him all the days of my life. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. I renounce my life and sin. And I will live with you forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together. Can we do that? Well, it's Easter. I'm going to give you a little time... Uh, off for good behavior we're going to be here for a minute just to pray so if you'd like to pray or just fellowship we've got time to do that today may the Lord bless you may he keep you may his face shine upon you may he give you health peace and joy in Jesus name amen happy Easter